please. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, please, everyone, if there's people outside to, to lower the voices, please. So, well, thank you very much, uh, to the Marcus and the, and the salon the organizers for inviting me, Caden and Wendy and for, for coming to this exciting workshop. And I'm going to come here to uh, tell you something slightly different in terms of the what commence method phase that will be useful for uh, That's the angle that we're going to come from. And I, I think we have a tremendous awesome scientific opportunities uh, in the next decade or so. There are some important sensors that's advancing extremely fast. Uh, one example being a clock. Uh, as you can see, the optical clock is advancing into 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the, 10 to the minus 19 regime, where we can use tools like this to probe fundamental physics on tabletop experiments in the laboratory. At the same time, these tools are built on quantum physics. You know, it's, it's a quantum sensing unit that you're building. And the many body physics, I would argue, is going to play an increasingly important role. And so with that perspective in mind, uh, the first thing I come to this workshop that I want to ask, talk to you, uh, is that we oftentimes talk about quantum simulation, talking about understanding high temperature superconductivity, understanding things that we can do with ultra-cold atoms that we can simulate uh, on this matter of physics. But we can equally ask questions for, you know, a clock is a very much at the soul of AMO well, physics. For an advancing clock for the next couple of decades, I would argue that we need to search for ourselves within the AMO community that what are the good dynamic phase that we need to drive a quantum matter for making the next generation clocks. And it's a driven quantum system where you have obviously have to worry about the field as you're driving the system, people using the word quenching, you're, you're moving Hamiltonian uh, during the process of the clock probe. Interactions is a very important time ordering is very important because you're driving this quantum system. In the end, the hope is that you will be able to preserve this very, very long coherence time. We, we hear about dissipation engineering and so on in today's talk. And the question is, can we, can we drive this quantum system during this process where there's a lot of interaction going on that we can preserve this very long coherence time the quantum system has to offer? At the same time, maybe you can actually use interactions uh, to actually help you to protect the accuracy of the quantum system of a clock. So it's not entirely clear now that used to be when we make a clock, you just simply say, oh, we're going to have a very precise control of individual particle systems, and then we can do the average. And very much, I think we have a new challenge where a quantum system is a many-body interacting system, and how do we navigate <coughs> our landscape where we can pursue the very best precision and the very best accuracy in our quantum sensors. And that's the challenge I'm putting up here. You know, you can look at some of the same Fermi Hopper model that we described in quantum magnetism. You know, let's add a spin optical coupling because you're going to drive with the field. Let's put a dipolar interactions because you can drive these dipole moments and put them all together. Um, is the best pocket to come from a Beckman insulator or band insulator? Well, not none of those because it's dipolar coupling. And there's a spatial correlation particles, <laughs> as well as a spin entanglement for the future beyond standard quantum model. There are a lot of, in, in fact, uh, uh, you know, intellectual push one can have for just build, building a better, better clock. And I think there's a very strong intellectual overlap with whether we are plotting uh, quantum simulations for condensed metaphysics. And that's what I find very exciting. And I hope that we're contributing a little bit to this workshop from this particular perspective. Um, and this can be said from you know, this one-dimensional quantum system we have been working on for a long, long time as, as a clock, where we trap atoms in this one-dimensional lattice, essentially 2D systems, and we drive in spins with very long coherent laser systems. And as we drive a spin up, um, we have a handful of uh, atoms in <coughs> a pancake, and this is a, uh, the typical block sphere, this little fuzziness indicating the quantum noise of individual spins being averaged over these many particles you have. But, but because you have many particles in this one single pancake, and you have a stack of pancakes, they can have a collective of P-wave interactions. And if your coherence time is long, this interaction will lead to the quantum noise to be correlated when the interaction, <coughs> P-wave interactions is a collective, and very weakly dependent on the mode of the momentum states of the particles in the 2D system, times coherence time much greater than one 
you can actually observe the quantum fluctuations of the individual particles become correlated. And in fact, you can just follow that quantum management model where you have a single axis twisting and, and, and look for non-classical spin noise, noise distribution in this and spin squeezing and so on. For a clock experiment, this turns out to be a, a hurdle because the frequency of the, the system now depends on the angle of how you evolve on the block sphere. And you can always argue, well, maybe it looks like there's a particular spin angle that the clock frequency shift equals, uh, goes to zero. The problem is when you, if you're not careful with the, all these spins interacting with each other, in fact, you wouldn't be able to drive the, the coherent uh, uh, evolution of the typical Ramsey frame because the interaction is so strong, actually blocks of a long coherence time that you would like to utilize on systems like that. And so that's a problem that motivated us to, or maybe I can set up a motivated us. This actually opens up other possibilities, for example, using this to study SUN physics, because it, uh, strong team atoms turns out to have these two orbits, uh, single S0, triple P0, these are so called clock states, and there's a nuclear spin degrees of freedom, which is wholly decoupled from electronic degrees of freedom since J equals to zero for the electronic angular momentum. So you can actually study SUN quantum magnetism using systems like this. But for making clock, this is, a, this, this is actually one of the road blocks that we want to avoid. And that motivated us to build a three-dimensional optical lattice system with a very simple motivation that if you have one atom per site, um, and if you can scale up to the system to, say, 100 by 100 by 100 in three-dimensional lattice, you can actually get a million atoms. Um, and if you can really pursue the coherence time of 160 seconds for your system, you will be able to build a clock at 10 to minus 20 per second. And right now, in order to get to 10 to minus 20, it will take us uh, three weeks to average out. And 10 to minus 20 will be great because by then, the atom on this layer and atom on this layer will have a different proper time. <laughs> so, so, that, so in order to get to this kind of early degeneracy of being able to load into 3D lattice clock, we, have to, we can actually take advantage of SUN physics because every uh, different nuclear spin states, they share the same scattering. So you can actually put all 10 nuclear spin states in the system and do evaporation very quickly. And we were able to, a couple of years ago, we were able to generate 100 million atoms, 100,000, so we wish 100 million, 100,000 strong medium sound atoms, basically 10 per nuclear spin state, and a 15 nanogram, so you have a 10 per PC, which was TL of TF of 0.05. And you can load into the lattice and, and you do a band mapping and a shell that you have to load with the band loaded. Um, what's really nice, actually, that another trick we learned from Florian Schreck's group back in 2013, they demonstrated for bosonic strontium 88. <coughs> they introduced this little trick where you have a, a typical optical trap, you put a gimbal in the middle, uh, goes back to the idea in, from MIT uh, back in the 90s. But the trick they added it was uh, this light shift that is, they call a transparency beam, which essentially is a transition that's tuned very close to triple P1, so shifts the AC stop shift of triple P1, but does very little thing to the trip in the S0. And this works because the cooling of the strong team is on, on using this narrow line transition. So you can see that within the optical dipole trap, the cooling works very effectively. Uh, it's almost looks like a magical wavelength. It's not quite as good as magical wavelength for clock as it for this single S0 triple P1 cooling. But so you can you can do you can be doing the cooling across the entire optical dipole trap except in the middle of the dimple, where the the, the AC stack shift of the excited state is shifting away from the ground state, so the cooling doesn't work, and the atom basically falls into the dimple and, and turns into dark. So you can get a very high efficiency loading uh, initial conditions in the dimple. And with that, we were able to recently demonstrate with the SU in physics, 10 nuclear spin states all working at the same time, and with a good initial condition for the dimple plus transparency, we can actually do three second evaporation. This is really amazing because before we had to do 20 seconds evaporation. Three seconds of evaporation later, we had T of T of 0.05. And this is the important for clock type of experiments is you want to be able to re prepare quantum states fast. And if we had to spend three seconds to, to do evaporation, that's still okay, even though it's not ideal, if I get to enjoy 160 seconds of coherence time later. And that would be three seconds wasted, 160 seconds for clock. So that's still worthwhile to me. And and so now let's think about, let's first, the first thing let's try to, to do is a modern state of clock. 
And by loading these atoms in the 3D lattice, uh, you can actually scan uh, the so-called side band scan, where you're preparing atoms to the ground, emotional ground state. And you, as you drive in all three different directions, you see the so-called mo blue emotional side band where driving the, the phonon or the vibrational quantum by one plus one. Up. <coughs> And you can, can see x, y, z directions, but it, the, there is no red side band because the atoms actually load in the absolute ground state. Um, is this an anisotropic lattice? I'm sorry? Is this an anisotropic lattice? Is that why x, y, z? Yes, x, y, z is the purpose. We can adjust them to be on top of each other here just to show that they can be separated. To just show you the three peaks there. And, and if you actually mix up the nuclear screen, as I mentioned, there's an SEO in symmetry. If you actually load with different nuclear spin states, then of course you can actually, just like Salim uh, uh, earlier told us, you can then have two different nuclear spin states occupying the, the lowest emotional ground state. In that case, the interaction is strong. You can have sort of double longs where you can have both symmetrical and anti symmetrical two orbital physics coming up. The point is that the frequency shift is so far away from the carrier when you have to identify single atom for that site that these no longer presented as a problem is a frequency shift for your clock. So with a, just a simple trick like this, we can get a uh, very long coherence time now uh, below one, uh, 100 megahertz on these clock transitions. And in fact, at, at the moment, we can push this to about 10 seconds. I will tell you, come back to tell you why we, we think the modern center is not the necessarily the best idea for working clocks. The quasi factor nevertheless is very good. Even with these numbers, modest 10 second coherence time, um, you can, you know, actually this is one of the, uh, the latest data on a single clock stability. Uh, and it's just showing the, the typical frequency instability as a function of averaging time. Using a laser that has coherence time on the order of uh, 60 seconds or so, has a line width of 10 megahertz. You can actually look at the transition of these three-dimensional optical lattice with a stability of just mid parts 10 to the 17 per second. So, quite decent uh, in terms of um, as, a, as a clock performance right now. And uh, not at 10 minus 20 yet. And that's another three orders of magnitude to go. But that, that's because we are only using a few thousand atoms at the moment. So uh, with this kind of a good measurement skill sets that we have spectroscopy, we, we can't help with all these incredible tools people have been developing with microscope. Uh, we, we can't help to put an imaging system also there. The our resolution is not quite as good as one single site. It's about two lattice sites. But as you can see, that it's already a very useful tool that we have to combine spectroscopy and the spatial resolution to, do, uh, to, to look at where the decoherence is coming from, what we can do uh, further. For example, you can look by doing this very long coherent preparation of the population in the, in the optical lattice. <coughs> You can look at the ground state population, you can look at the excited state population from the same cloud, and you can then calculate what is the, the, the normalized excitation locally in, uh, throughout this three-dimensional lattice. And from that, you can actually look at the correlations. What if, for example, if we really want to turn this into a gra gravity meter, you know, you want to measure the gravitational potential difference between this set of the cloud, that set of the cloud, presumably say this is the, the vertical direction. And if you have the sensitivity of 10 to minus 20, 10 to minus 21, you will be able to measure the time difference uh, at, this, uh, you know, uh, at this level within the tens of micron spacing, you should, you should actually be able to measure the frequency difference. So pretend that that's, there's a gradient there and you can actually see when the time scale is short, there's no phase difference between those. The, the frequency diff there's a phase difference is basically zero. So it's a strong correlation between uh, region P1 and region P2 in terms of the excitation fraction. But as you wait longer, longer time, this, this phase diagram turns into elliptical, and that's because there's a, if there's a frequency offset, there will be a phase difference that's been developing. So you can use tools like this to really allow you to measure within this crowd of the quantum gas clock, what are the measurement precision you can have. And here it takes about three hours to get to two times 10 minus 19. Um, and again, that, that's limited by the number of atoms that we can use. And most limitations because of the coherence time is not 160 seconds, whether it's a second. seconds. So uh, just to show off a little bit with te techniques like this, not single-sided, beautiful image we saw this morning from Wasim, from Martin, and so on. 
But nevertheless, it's a very useful tool. For example, when we always say this is a natural wavelength clock, and the ground state and excited state of the clock states have the same AC structure. And with tools like this, with the, where you can have both imaging and the spectroscopy resolutions, you can take one shot and tell you that, you know, actually the ground state and excited state is differing on the AC structure by one hertz. And that's because the, you know, the central part of the fringe of the atoms are all being excited going out a little bit, it's no longer excited, going out a little bit, it's excited again, just like a neutral ring. And it's the classical coherence now that's controlling into the spatial distribution of the atom. You can also apply, say, a magnetic field gradient, and you can see the stripes of atom being excited, atom not being excited, atom being excited again. So all these are the optical coherence that atom uh, laser interactions cannot be frozen as a, as a spatial image that you can see. So, we can also now use this tool to image interaction. For example, this goes back, and I'm sure that Simon Fallon tomorrow is going to discuss the two orbital physics, because this title actually talks about two orbital physics. But let me just uh, squeeze in a couple of slides to tell you about the two orbital physics in the constructing side. You can have both electronic and nuclear degrees of freedom, so you can have a symmetrization, symmetrization anti symmetrization of fermions can be uh, arranged in this so called a nuclear spin singlet, nuclear spin triplet manner, or you can talk about electronic <coughs> singlet. And, and so as you scan, uh, when you have a two ground states, then necessarily what happens is the nuclear spin to be anti symmetrized. And there's an interaction that the two, two orbital Hamiltonian can be written down. Basically, you can think of as the direct, ex ex direct interactions and, uh, and the spin exchange interactions, giving rise to the by the UEG plus and UEG minus associated with these two different symmetrizations that you have, and also a ground state interaction. So this is both describing two atoms. But of course, we can load three, we can load four, we can load five. And, and this, this allow you now to start to, to study the emergence of the multi-particle interactions in a very clean uh, three-dimensional optical light system. And that's because we can spectroscopically address these main occupied sites and it basically just matter frequency shifts give rise by these, uh, as, as the occupation number changes, these frequency shifts. And it's very cleanly demonstrated in an experiment like this, where here's your clock transition with only one atom per site. And by the time you have two, three, four, five, and can be symmetrized, uh, uh, arranged in the electronic degree of freedom, or anti symmetrized in the electronic degree of freedom. And because of ACM symmetry, it doesn't matter what nuclear spin combination you use, we only have two peaks, two plus, two minus, three plus, three minus, they all converge into a single peak. Uh, and you can use this technique, um, for example, if you select three atoms, that's three plus, and you actually drive this transition, blow away all the other atoms, and you can take a big shot. And this is the distribution in a 3D lattice of for this particular three plus state. <coughs> and so it's a very clean measurement that allows you to measure both the arising of the multi-particle interactions as well as decay. Um, and when we were comparing experimental results with the theory prediction made by Anna Maria's group, you can see the two-body theory is inadequate to explain the experimental result, uh, which is uh, represented by the red dots. It, the theory tends to overestimate. And then the reason is, uh, intuitively speaking, uh, you can think of when the interaction gets stronger and stronger, a single particle wave function will have to be modified. Uh, and Andreas group actually demo, uh, has developed the effective three-body interactions essentially by putting expected atoms in there and it, the, using this uh, multi-orbital, multi uh, multi-vibrational orbital calculations to loop in this effective and the expected atoms as part of the three-body interactions. And, and by using this technique, they can actually explain the observed three-body frequency shift very well. Um, and that, in fact, this three-body interaction is, can no longer be teased out as a three different pairs, and uh, it's actually a really genuine three-body interaction. And you can explain that for four-body and five-body as well. And what's quite amazing is with the help of Jose Dinkow and Paul Julian, they can not only predict sort of a reactive part of the, the real part of the interaction, but they can also use this to capture the three-body, four-body, five-body imaginary part of the interaction, which predicts the lifetime. And these, these measurements are very clean, since these atoms are isolated from the bulk. And you can, we are really looking at the three particles, and how they, what's the last rate, four particles, what is the last rate. <laughs> 
So this is a, a one effective use of imaging spectroscopy to figure out the emergence of the multi-particle interactions from two particles. And I like Celine's statement today, you know, we start with two and we ended up always boggled down with two, and then finally he moved on to three. Uh, and uh, it, it's good that we can do up to three and four particles in, in the lattice here. A little clock spectroscopy. So with this kind of tool, you want to say, well, let's let's go for 160 second coherence time because that's what a strong command is, is is good for. Uh, it has this uh, calculated lifetime of uh, ground state state to be 160 seconds. And indeed, we look at this uh, ground state atoms in there, and lifetime is actually greater than 10 seconds. But when we actually put them in coherence the position, it turns out there's an issue. And the lifetime, the coherence time decays away in 20 seconds. And we can watch the ground state and excited state population looking at the ground state decaying, going up, uh, the excited state decaying away, ground state going up. And what's happening is turns out to be from the ground state, and this is our clock, two clock states, ground and excited. This excited state is closer to this 813 nanometers of the mass wave dense lattice. It's closer to the upper line in the state that allow you to do the Raman scattering onto the triple P1 and the triple P2. So the P2 will still be Raman scattered back. Eventually, the triple P1 is the one that's going to decay back down to the S0. And that's really the reason of being leaky for the excited state and the, and the gain population the ground state. And the measurement and the calculation agree quite well. So we are very clear, we are very certain that this is actually the mechanism where the coherence, decoherence is coming in. Uh, so that means we must reduce the lattice intensity. Um, in order to do that, there is one uh, question that we have to ask is, in order, uh, when you lower the lattice intensity, the atoms going to tunnel. And, and <coughs> what's the consequence of this? You know, we have been relying on the so-called magical wavelength, where you use a very deep lattice. The ground and excited state is being driven, essentially basically goes from flat band to flat band. That's why there's a clock frequency shift. If you start to lower the lattice step, the band is going to have to develop a bandwidth. Um, the atoms could have potentially come off. But what's worse is that the clock laser we use have a different wavelength than the 813 nanometer laser that you use to create the lattice. So if you propagate the laser along the direction of where they're creating the lattice, you're going to pick up the phase shift, E to the IKA, um, A being the lattice spacing, K being the wave vector of the clock laser. So you have these phase shifts across these different sites. So as these atoms tunnel back and forth, they are no longer identical fermions. If you compare them to be identical fermions, in fact, they, they are now being driven to different spin angles. And you have this, uh, this uh, tunneling J. <laughs> And that's really the question of the so-called spin-off of the coin. If, uh, if the lattice is being lowered to sufficient low depth, depth we calculated that it needed to be below 10 recoil, where you can have the, the Raman scattering to be sufficiently low that you can enjoy 160 second coherence time. So if you want to go there, the, the band develops enough bandwidth there, and it, this is the ground state excited state. Mm -hmm. If you have no recoil momentum, this transition will still be independent of your uh, uh, pausing momentum. But we all know that, the, that actually the transition itself has a recoil momentum because the E to the I, K, A is not matched. If, uh, if you go back to this slide, you have this extra phase factor. In order to remove that, transform that phase factor away, you can, we can do that by just move the lattice of the excited state back here by, by the amount of the, the phase shift that I talked about, E to the I, K, A, with which you can translate into a pause momentum transformation. And now the transition going from ground to excited state depends on the quasi momentum because these two curvatures no longer match. So, so now we have this extra term of the phasing, which is proportional to the quasi momentum. And, and this can be actually very easily solved as this extra phase factor that's given by the Ka that gives rise to this, this uh, band structure for clock transition. Um, and this is the effective uh, phasing mechanism of the uh, effective magnetic field that coupling to the spin uh, of this uh, ground excited state. And you can actually uh, visualize this as a picture where now this value oscillation is not, not only proportional to the original uh, omega that you are driving at, at the tuning, but also proportional to this spin over a couple uh, cause effective magnetic field. And what you can think of, this is basically spin motion locking, that each quasi momentum gives rise to different rocket frequencies. As experimentally, we can show this very beautifully because 
the, skin, uh, the, the, spot, uh, the alpine earth system is very long lived, that you can actually pick a particular uh, quasi momentum Q and put that population in a fixed size scale, remove all other quasi momentum, and you just watch that particular very narrow slice of a quasi momentum oscillate back and forth in the lattice. And this is the rocket oscillation that you can, you, can, you can show. So it's a kind of interest, even more interesting that if you want to think about interactions in that regime. So this is now the band structure, and I removed the locating frame, I removed the H bar omega, and so what's left, the, the optical frequency, what's left is just the right beat driving, and so that's why there's a void crossing here. And these are the original band structure that you have. Um, as you drive this, uh, you can see that this gain scale states diverges at the DEDK equals to zero, so as you drive this, you will see that the clock frequency now has this uh, non-zero detuning depending on the quasi momentum, and there's a two particular gain scale states where it's the, the largest here. So, so both of this entire, instead of the previous slide I showed you, you can select a particular quasi momentum and, and see very clean radio oscillation. If you pick a very short clock pulse, you can actually drive all of these. Do Ramsey experiment, you can drive all of these quasi momentum at once. Perfect. Yeah. And, and this shows a picture of the way you do Ramsey spectroscopy under the spin orbital coupling. And if you do a very short pulse, you're locating all the spins up to, to, to this equatorial plane. And if you wait for a while, <coughs> these two uh, density of states, one to the left of the detuning zero, the other one to the right of the detuning zero, basically corresponding to the plasma momentum of the zero and a pi, will, will be rotating uh, in the opposite angle because they have an opposite detuning, essentially, opposite defective magnetic field. And if you do the second Ramsey pulse, you can actually watch the, the Ramsey fringe goes through the dips of zero and comes back and goes through zero and comes back. You can actually vary the, the, the promoting rate and as long as you normalize to the, the, the <coughs> amount of time you wait for your energy range, the, the picture is universal. And this is just single particle spin orbital coupling uh, physics in, in, uh, under Randy spectroscopy. But what's interesting is if you tune on interactions by putting more particles into your, into your lattice system, here uh, you have the spin orbital coupled magnetic field spin for uh, fusion of the spin. And then, as I explained earlier, uh, Sorry, that this is the this is the block sphere. If you look down along the axis, that's the plane that I want you to be focusing on with x and y. So this is initially we put a spin here in coherence composition, and it's going to diffuse because of this term. But now you turn on these interactions. This is the, the earlier uh, collective spin interaction term that I described. There's also a spin spin interaction that's it's, it's being induced by the spin of the coupling. So it's not mixing up with the S wave, the P wave. If this interaction is strong enough compared to the coloring rate, what happens is instead of moving away, as indicated by the two blue arrows, the, the spin itself is actually processing back and forth uh, because of the spin locking effect due to the fact that there's this energy gap created by spin spin interaction under the spin orbital coupling. So there's an interesting spin dynamics that you can study under spin orbital coupling. You know, this is the one piece. And that's the picture where you, when the spin interaction is strong, you actually never see it goes to this uh, zero crossing of any different factors. Uh, the spin basically locks onto each other. So let's repeat that in the three dimensional system under microscope. Um, and what we see is that if you look under the spin procession, uh, when, the, when we lower the lattice step, remember that was the goal, was to try to get to the 160 second coherence time. So if you just naively lower the lattice step, there's a problem because what we see is this, the spin of the coupling uh, it, 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 uh, reflects itself as a phasing problem. If we look into the actual what's going on at the center of the fringe, of the center of the trial, we can see the, the, the fringe of the Ramsey spectroscopy decays away a lot quicker than if it's looking at the edge. And this, this can be very simply explained by the fact that now you can, in the three-dimensional lattice, you have a very strong external confinement of the, of the harmonic potential. So on the edge of the cloud, you simply have this displacement of these uh, lattice well to be strong enough, beta, much bigger than J. So, if, so when beta is much greater than J, uh, there is no tunneling going on. But if it's not much less than J, there, there, there will be this <coughs> oscillating back and forth due to the positive momentum itself. Being, being driven by the external potential uh, and the spin momentum. So actually we have a 
observe the more complex patterns when, when you allow yourself to, not only along the key vectors, you have a low lattice scatter, but also along the other direction, you also lower the lattice scatter, such that you have the tunneling both JX and JY. And in fact, it's actually an interesting system that you can, it's a three-dimensional optical lattice. Your clock laser does not have to go on a particular direction. You can go on in any direction. So you can have, in fact, have K KX, KY, KZ, they can all burn a phase in, uh, along X, Y, and Z directions. So in principle, you can use this to study three-dimensional spin of the component right there, just to use laser. Um, so for now, I think it was limited time. I want to go back to the, the answering the question. So with this, the presence of spin over the coupling and the very complicated interaction picture, for the clock, what are you going to do? I think it comes back to the question that if we wanted the atom to be to, to remain stationary, uh, it's not going to be because they're going to have a finite uh, lattice depth that they're going to tunnel if you have only one atom per site. Uh, if you have, oh, say you have two wells with one atom, it's going to jump back and forth. But you can solve the problem by matching the spacing of the lattice to the clock wavelengths, such that when the atom is jumping back and forth, it picks up the same amount of phase shift, whether it's in the left well or right well. As far as the clock laser is concerned, it couldn't tell because the phase shift is too high uh, uh, times integer due to the fact that the wavelength is, is commensurate with the, the, uh, the slight spacing. If that's the case, this term equals to 1, the signal of the coupling term is turned off. But that, so, so you can, we actually start to setting up accordion lattice just like that. You just, I mean, two beams coming in with the angle of theta, you can adjust this angle sine of theta that you can actually get the lattice spacing to be close to the wavelength. In order to get this exactly equal to 1, it, it, this would actually be a fairly demanding requirement. You would have to adjust the angle to, to something below really, really accuracy, and that's difficult. Fortunately, if you introduce a little bit of interaction with two fermions, two wells, and if you just get the, the distance roughly right, the, the fact that they're, they're interacting, they will keep themselves uh, uh, sort of stable, and you can actually very, very easily reach the so in the regime of the mod insulating and bank, bank insulating regime, uh, and, you know, in some sense, you can actually pull them apart in the so-called atom regime, the atom insulator regime, that they won't talk to each other anymore. Uh, but of course, we are always greedy. We want to pack in as many atoms as possible in a finite volume. So that's really the goal, right? We, I don't want to build a lattice which is a room full and the atoms are, uh, are, are centimeters apart. That's not as interesting as trying to put it in as, 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 as dense as possible and still be able to find a way to work. So this is what is our current thinking of making the clock in, the, in light of these spin of the coupling, in light of these, uh, how you drive these Fermi systems. Um, and the, the last question, I think, is in the remaining two minutes, or maybe one minute, or maybe the, no time, <laughs> no, no time. Uh, is that there's a one last thing you have to worry about the collective bipolar coupling. Since I'm running out of time, I won't talk about this. It's just that it, you know, there's another interesting fact that you can you can think about the geometry of the uh, lattice where you have to worry about the radiations with the subradiance. A number of people, in fact, Andrew, during his opening talk today, already talked about the, the dipolar coupling. And this was, is going to be an important problem at 10 to minus 20 when you talk about optical clocks, there will be a very strong bipolar coupling. That, so how do we navigate through that space and still be able to you know, avoid these large frequency shifts? But it looks like it's possible. You can adjust the angle of the lattice spacing where you can have places where the dipole interaction cancel each other and so on. So this is a really the challenge, right? How do we navigate through this many body landscape Building clock is no longer a single particle physics uh, project. It's really a many body physics project. It's very much in the spirit of this group, this community here, to simulating quantum uh, magnetism, to use the Hamiltonian and the standard very well. And with that, I want to thank the people who are working on it. Uh, mostly, I talked about Strunking 2 system, quantum gas experiment that's led by graduate student Ross Hudson, and uh, postdoc Haki Goben, and Ed Mani has left us. Christian Center and the new graduate student in Um and uh, with a lot of support from NM River Race Group. Thank you very much.
orbit coupling with interaction Ramsey fringes. Um, it looked like you, uh, you know, everything was nice and smooth without interactions, but when you turned interactions on, there was this cusp at short times. Do you understand, you know, what's going on there? You mean here? Exactly. Yeah. That, that red line has it looks like an exponential instead of a gas. Yeah. Well, um, this is it. Um, Actually, this, this this understanding is actually basically just the mean field. Uh, I, I think we understand that here very well. It's just the mean, mean field behavior. There are losses. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering what is what is the coupling strength between your three P zero and three P one state from your lattice equations? The, the part where you said you need to reduce your Lattice depth to suppress these losses through this intermediate state. Um, you're talking about this. Um, no, sorry. You had, uh, earlier, that you're talking yeah. about the Raman scattering, right? Right. Yeah. Just go there, so so we can talk about which particular branch that you're asking that for. Um, this yeah. this one. Right. What do we? What was the question? What is the coupling between the three P zero and three P one state? Oh, between these two. Yeah. Due to the Raman coupling. Yeah. Uh, this is exactly what we calculate. Okay. So I was just wondering if you could exploit somehow a company from a 3P1 state to let's say that 6S state to so move it far enough away that it doesn't matter anymore. So you are saying you apply another laser to try to move this frequency <laughs> away? Yeah. That, you know, look, if, if the thing is already very far away compared to, if the, from this transition of, of maybe what you're asking is what's the frequency between triple P0 and the sin of triple S1? Right uh, from the 5s success, this is uh, something that's 700 nanometer or so. So A13 is already very far. If you're trying to use AC structure to try to measure uh, to move triple P1, it's going to have issues. Like your your clock state is going to be tremendously fast. Uh, so you can have AC structures on the clock state, which is bad. So there's not a really good way of uh, sh uh, shutting this off. Uh, you know, the, you, what you are trying to think of is sort of a quantum Zeno effect, you know, some, introducing some, some loss that's very specific to the state, such that they can't have populations here. Um, we thought about it. It's, a, it's very difficult to introduce something without affecting the triple P0. You know, this is a, because they are, they are actually very close together. They are about terabits apart. And, and the, really, the way we think of is you simply reduce the lattice intensity down to something like, a, by the time you go to 10 recoil, this this uh, lifetime will be 160 seconds, and and the challenge we put forth to, to in front of us is how do we solve the problem with a 10 recoil lattice without having uh, spin orbital coupling or uh, solve the problem of Christian, Jun that you have better coherence on the edge because basically your gradient yeah. tunes your spin orbital. Yeah, that's kind of a trivial thing. Yes, but but can't you just just put uh, this order? That's right. The people talk about so so this is indeed the one item that we were looking into is just a disorder. And, and the question is is a fifty percent disorder or ten percent disorder enough? Uh, well larger than the coupling strength you have or uh, yeah, larger than the coupling strength. And, and it's so most likely it could be okay because in the end we are moving towards very, very low library frequency. We want hundred sixty second coherence time. So the, so in some sense the, the time scale is very short, very small. So I have a question about the magic wave. Yeah. So uh, let's say how in, so is the slow path as a function of uh, the difference. I know what you are asking. Yeah. Somehow, how resistant are you if you go out of the magic wave? To let's say to because of course you can decrease the power mm -hmm. or uh, <coughs> increase the decay somehow. And then the question is, to what would you be? I think includes the tuning is, is much harder because the tuning runs away uh, very slowly. And so it's, if you're trying to change the wavelength of 813, um, you're not going to change a lot because it's just a wall of data. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. The, the, the differential sensitivity that, uh, between those two, the frequency shift is about 1 hertz per gigahertz of, of lattice depth. So it's actually pretty gentle. Um, uh, and, and so you can play games a little bit, uh, but I, in the end, 
you know, we are trying to go for 100 microhertz difference or 10 microhertz difference in the clock. And any frequency difference between these two is, is a worry. That we would rather making sure these states are really solidly um, on top of each other without, although you could argue that you know, by now you have a 3D lattice. If you can make a very flat 3D lattice, then that's maybe a possibility to just characterize this shift. But, the, but you're worried about the inhomogeneity. You know, there's always a little bit of curvature in our 3D lattice. Um, another thing that was very surprising to me initially was, well, didn't we say these two states are magic wavelengths, so they should have exactly the same polarizability? And that, that would mean they would also have the same you know, uh, imaginary part of a scattering. And it turns out that that is true if you calculate only the Rayleigh scattering. The, the Rayleigh scattering rate from triple P0 and single P0 is exactly the same. But the Raman scattering is not. But the fish level and solar part of the S doesn't have the same frequency. Huh? Say the don't the fish have some tensorial part that we have in the first place? The they both have a tensor and, and the factor. Yeah, because but there's a nuclear spin, it's actually not zero. Yeah, it's electronically it's zero, but it, but the nuclear spin turns out you do have a tensor and tensorial factor. But it's different. Yes, different. Uh, it's different, but you can you can make them to match. That's right. So when we when we say match wavelengths, that in, includes maybe maybe you'll be because you're running a bit out of time, it becomes a bit more. Yeah, sorry. So, so we have time for maybe two quick questions because people raise their hands, but with two quick answers. As okay. Well. <laughs> uh, so. Thank you very much. Uh, we already 